Forgotten Crimes Remembered Victims Number 3. Little Lord Fauntleroy Sadly, some crimes are mostly forgotten, murderers never facing justice for their vile deeds, and the victims in danger of being dishonored once more by being lost to history. Details are scarce in many forgotten crimes, but what little is known must be passed on so at least the victims can be remembered. Then there are murders where the victim's identity is unknown, so that their names can never be properly remembered. And many times the unknown leads to speculation that can never be verified, and that speculation only adds to the mystery. One such victim has only been remembered as Little Lord Fauntleroy, the moniker being inspired by the book of the same name written by Francis Hodgson Burnett, which was first serialized in St. Nicholas Magazine from November 1885 to October 1886 before published in novel format in 1886. But unlike the book, this story did not have a happy ending. Some person or persons got away with a little boy's murder. On March 8, 1921 in Waukesha, Wisconsin, a one John Brulich, employed by what the press called the O'Laughlin Stone Company found the corpse of a little boy floating in the quarry pond. Brulich called the authorities, and Waukesha County Sheriff, Clarence Keebler quickly arrived at the quarry with County Coroner L. F. Lee. Let's pause briefly here to see if we can find the actual location of the quarry. Waukesha of the mid to late 1800s and well into the 20th century was a city dotted with many quarries. Limestone mining was a lucrative industry that continues in Waukesha to the present day. The O'Laughlin quarry in question would have been owned and operated by the powerful O'Laughlin family. Big John O'Laughlin purchased land in the area that over time would become three quarries that he would combine into the Waukesha Lime and Stone Company. Big John continued to grow the operation, even buying out quarries operated by the Hatfield Company, which opened some of the first quarries in the area, as well as buying quarries in Racine and Waterloo, Wisconsin. The complete company was known as the O'Laughlin Stone Company. In Waukesha, the quarries owned by Big John were called the Waukesha Lime and Stone Company. Big John was president of the Waukesha Lime and Stone Company until his death in 1913, after which his son, John Joseph O'Laughlin, would be president until his 1925 death. So, at the time of the Little Lord Fauntleroy murder, the O'Laughlin family still owned the Waukesha Lime and Stone Company, although the Payne and Dolan Company would develop a close association with the company in 1926, but the O'Laughlin family would continue to own the Waukesha Lime and Stone Company until 1949, about the time that another mystery would become a part of this story. Payne and Dolan, now known as P&D, bought complete control of the Waukesha Lime and Stone Company in 1965, until they became part of the Walbeck Group, which owns the Waukesha Lime and Stone Company today. But what is important for this story is that the Waukesha Lime and Stone Company has been in continuous operation since 1911, and the area of the quarry of importance to this investigation may not have seen much work since at least the late 40s. But which quarry was the one in which little Lord Fauntleroy was found? This quote from the Waukesha Daily Freeman on April 14, 1949, gives a clue. Fauntleroy's body was found floating near the surface of the Waterfield, abandoned south end of the Waukesha Lime and Stone Company quarry in which a Milwaukee Police Department diver searched for the body of Cecilia LeMay, October, 1948. And yes, the Cecilia LeMay disappearance plays a future part in the Fauntleroy investigation. Keep in mind the photo of the area searchers looked for Cecilia LeMay in 1948. As the 1949 article said, the body was found in the Waterfield, abandoned south end of the Waukesha Lime and Stone Company quarry, so, this part of the quarry would have been already been out of operation by the time a diver searched for the body of Cecilia LeMay in 1948. The large Waukesha Lime and Stone Company operation has two quarrying operations divided by the road and the Fox River. As you can see the operation to the left is overgrown along the banks of the pond on the southern part of the quarry. This is the most likely area for Fauntleroy's body to have been found. Let's take an aerial tour of the complete Waukesha Lime and Stone Company location with an emphasis on the possible location where Fauntleroy's body was found.
The body discovered was described as being between five and seven years old, curly blonde hair, brown-eyed, although an official released sketch said he had light blue eyes, and was missing a tooth on his lower jaw, whether the tooth had been knocked out during the murder or lost at some other time is not known, he was about three feet six inches tall, shorter than usual for his age. The corpse was well nourished and showed no signs of long-term abuse. He was well dressed in expensive clothes including a grey sweater made by the Bradley Knitting Company, striped rompers or long blouse depending on source, black stockings, black patent leather shoes or black rubbers depending on source, possibly topped with white spats covering his ankles, and underwear made by the Minnesota-based Munsingware Company. At first, authorities considered this to be a tragic accident. City and county authorities began a search for a missing local boy, which yielded nothing. The focus of the investigation shifted to murder after the autopsy revealed the cause of death to be blunt force trauma to the back of the head, and only a small amount of water in his lungs suggesting he had been dead before being submerged. Due to the cold water and the pond ice probably only recently melting, the coroner determined he might have been in the pond for days or several months. Early speculation included investigators thinking the boy may have been kidnapped from a wealthy family, but in the days long before they had nationwide databases to look through, this continued to be only speculation. With no leads coming in, the boy's body was put on public display at a local funeral home in the hopes that someone might recognize him. Regional newspapers printed his sketch and description. A reward was offered, first $250, which grew to $1,000. But nothing brought in leads or potential suspects. Another quarry employee, Mike Coker, came forward stating that five weeks earlier he had seen a couple searching the quarry pond area. The woman, who had been wearing a red sweater, was distraught and weeping, but he didn't get a good look at the man. The woman asked if anyone had seen a young boy in the area. The only lead investigators had to go on was that the couple drove away in a Ford. Investigators thought that the couple might have sent the boy off to play while they had a fling in the car and that the boy might have gotten hit on the head by a falling stone and then fell in the pond. Later, authorities received a tip that the woman in the red sweater drowned herself in the pond, but searches, including using dynamite to free a possibly entangled corpse from submerged plants or debris, yielded nothing. Owner of the local Liberty Department store, David Dobrik, came forward stating that he had sold the outfit in January, and that the clothing was so expensive that he did not carry them in his store but had gotten a good deal by getting them on sale from a store that was going out of business. However, he could not give a description of the buyer, and could provide no additional information. The next lead came from Chicago resident, J.B. Belson, who claimed the boy was his nephew, the son of his sister, Mrs. G. E. Hornbridge, and the boy and a sibling had been kidnapped by her ex-husband, who had threatened to murder her children several times. But investigators quickly established the children were alive and well. A local woman, Minnie Conrad, organized a fundraiser to cover little Lord Fauntleroy's funeral expenses, and he was laid to rest on March 14, 1921 at the Prairie Home Cemetery. Someone carved the words, Our Darling, on his small, white casket. And so, the case of Little Lord Fauntleroy was written off as an unsolved murder and forgotten by most. But Minnie Conrad placed flowers on his grave yearly until she died. And legend states that another woman visited his grave every year, but that may be only an urban legend. Then, by fate or pure luck, a Milwaukee police diver searched the same quarry pond on October 8, 1948, for the body of the missing Cecilia LeMay. And suspicion fell on Cecilia's husband, Edmund. Cecilia was Edmund's third wife, but this wasn't the first time that a member of Edmund's family went missing. Edmund and his first wife, Hazel, had had a child, Homer. Hazel died from tuberculosis in 1921. Soon after, six-year-old Homer went missing. And Edmund's story was basically bullshit. Edmund claimed Homer had been adopted by a couple called the Nortons. The Nortons later sent Edmund a newspaper article from Argentina, saying that Homer had been killed in a car accident. However, no trace could be found of the Nortons, 
whom Edmund claimed had both conveniently died by that time. In 1949, Milwaukee police sent a detective, Captain Adolf Kramer to Argentina, but he could find no proof that the accident ever happened. But investigators were just starting to dig into the bizarre history of Edmund LeMay. After the death of Hazel and disappearance of Homer, Edmund married his second wife, Ruby, and they had three children. During the investigation, Ruby told police that Edmund had tried to murder her several times, once he had tried to electrocute her by throwing a live electrical cord into her bath. She claimed the electric shock threw her from the bathtub and it was by pure luck that she escaped electrocution. He claimed he had accidentally dropped his electric shaver. It was during his marriage to Ruby that Edmund met the also married Cecilia Seabrainer, and they began an affair. Edmund convinced Cecilia to divorce her husband, and he divorced Ruby in 1941. He and Cecilia were married in 1943. But it wasn't long before Edmund's attraction turned to another woman, this time to Eva Clark. Clark worked under Cecilia, who was employed by the Milwaukee school system, supervising the lunch programs for 38 schools in suburban and rural Milwaukee County schools. Edmund and Cecilia told neighbors and co-workers that Edmund had gotten a job in Newark, New Jersey and that he and Cecilia would be moving soon. But Edmund later added that first, they would be taking a trip to Canada to visit a sick aunt. Neighbors watched the house for ten days, expecting the couple to return. Edmund returned alone, but soon left in Cecilia's car with none other than Eva Clark and her son. County officials grew worried when both women failed to show up for their jobs. Cecilia had told friends that she wouldn't be moving to New Jersey immediately, but would stay on at her job for six months until a replacement could be found. Cecilia's neighbors and friends had also grown suspicious that something was wrong. Especially since the day after Edmund had left with the woman and child, another couple moved into the LeMay residence. The new neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Fred Roll claimed that Edmund told them Cecilia had decided to go directly from Canada to New Jersey, the exact opposite of what Cecilia had told the neighbors, friends, and employer. A friend of Cecilia's contacted the Canadian aunt, who replied that she had seen neither Cecilia nor Edmund. A detective checked with Cecilia's employers, who stated they did receive a letter postmarked from Newark in which Cecilia notified them she would not be returning, and there was proof of Cecilia cashing her last four paychecks in Newark. Although this temporarily stopped the police investigation, Cecilia's friend still found the situation suspicious. Cecilia was failing to answer their letters. She seemed to be avoiding even lifelong friends. Sheriff Hanley and a deputy flew to Newark and went to the LeMay residence. A woman answered the door and identified herself as Mrs. LeMay, but it was not Cecilia. It was Eva Clark. And incidentally, Eva Clark provided the bulk of the funds to purchase the Newark residence, just as Cecilia had done to buy the Wisconsin home. To make the story even more convoluted, Eva said that Cecilia ran away. When Edmund showed up, he added to the bullshit, saying he had not seen Cecilia since June 15 when she had left him a note saying she was going west with Bill. He claimed the entire Canadian trip and everything else had just been made up because he didn't want people to know his wife had left him. As it turned out, Edmund had written the note to Cecilia's employers, as well as the note saying Cecilia had left with a man named Bill, and had cashed Cecilia's paychecks. He had even closed out two checking accounts. He even admitted he had pawned Cecilia's wedding and engagement rings. Eva Clark then admitted that she had driven Cecilia's car back to Wisconsin and then returned to Newark in it. In Wisconsin, a garage attendant recognized the car and questioned Clark, who then lied that she was Cecilia's sister and that Cecilia was in Canada. Clark also claimed that her relationship with LeMay was platonic, but stating that Edmund was a good meal ticket, and they were waiting to be married after Edmund could get a divorce on the grounds of desertion. Edmund was injected with sodium pentothal, and Sheriff Hanley said his answers indicated that he did not know where Cecilia was. Edmund and Eva were returned to Wisconsin where Edmund was charged with forgery and Eva charged with driving a car without the owner's permission. However, the charges against Eva Clark would be dropped. 
Eva had returned to Wisconsin voluntarily and the charges were not enough for extradition. The charges against Edmund went little further, his lawyer, Robert Jones stated. LeMay is not a criminal. His wife just walked out. Edmund pleaded not guilty to the forgery charges and was released on $2,000 bail. Judge Herbert Steffes commented. This simple prosecution of forgery certainly cannot, and should not, be translated by the state to express its disappointment in the frustration of its investigation into the disappearance of Mrs. LeMay. LeMay cannot be prosecuted successfully on forgery charges unless Mrs. LeMay is produced or evidence is adduced that she disappeared involuntarily and that LeMay was the cause of her disappearance. Police dug up the cellar and yard of the LeMay home, and at this point the diver also searched the quarry pond on October 8, 1948, and even proceeded to drain it, but nothing was found of Cecilia. In 1949 Milwaukee medical examiner E. L. Thuringer recalled that the same pond that had recently been searched for Cecilia LeMay had been the same pond in which little Lord Fauntleroy had been found and brought up the fact that LeMay's son, Homer, from first wife, Hazel, had been reported missing under strange circumstances. As previously mentioned, in April 1949, the Milwaukee Police Department sent Detective Kramer to South America to check out LeMay's dubious account on the death of Homer. He found no proof to back up LeMay's claim. Then, Thuringer suggested the body of Little Lord Fauntleroy be exhumed as part of the LeMay investigation. However, Sheriff Leslie P. Rock teacher and Coroner Alvin H. Johnson did not agree. Eva Clark died from cancer in June, 1950. The second of Edmund's wives to die from illness. In 1955, after Cecilia had been declared legally dead, Edmund received her estate too. It seems that Edmund had a habit of marrying ill women and then inheriting the rewards from their deaths. So, who was little Lord Fauntleroy? Was he Homer LeMay? Did Edmund LeMay get away with committing the murders of Homer and Cecilia? And if Homer was not the boy called Little Lord Fauntleroy, then who was he? <laughs>